he is doubting Will's natty status 100% right now. <laughs> Your arms have gotten so much bigger, bro. It's freaking That's insane. Right. Are you bulking or cutting right now? Cutting. You're natural or enhanced right now. And so this is where it gets interesting. Coach Greg, in today's video, we're going over the best exercises for each muscle group featuring none other than six foot tall Will Tennyson and five foot four Jeff Nippert. And so remember, these two have amazing genetics. Some people argue, how could they have amazing genetics? Jeff Nippert's a five foot four manlet like Coach Greg. How can he have great genetics? What you don't know is he's an elite level power lifter and champion bodybuilder. And Will, on the other hand, who y'all think just has a mid-level physique that he's just all right he's so jacked so impressive that even jeff nippard doubts his natural status as he describes in this video so i have three criteria the first is high tension and high stre high stretch the second thing is it needs to feel good and then the third thing is potential for overload that's it. So the three main factors decide if the exercise is good is, does it actually stretch that muscle? If it doesn't stretch the muscle, not as great of an exercise. The second, you have to actually enjoy it. That to me is paramount. If you hate an exercise, are you gonna really train harder than last time? And the third thing it has to do is offer for potential overload. If you can't keep pushing harder, then how can it be any better? For example, if you're doing push-ups and you wanna do a set of 10 to 15, but it's too easy for you, you can do 50, then it's very difficult to go harder than last time on a push-up. Lately, I've been doing a lot of Smith machine squats. Mm -hmm. For the quads, we're going with the Smith machine squats. The reason being you can go very close or even at failure without that same sense of risk. Remember, if you do an exercise and it's dangerous and you're fearful of going hard, then how can you push yourself? And so if you're doing squats and you're scared to push that extra rep and you know you can push harder than that, then perhaps it's better to stick with Smith machine squats. And so with the Smith machine squats, we're taking care of both the quads and the glutes, both at the same time. And so essentially you're getting two for the price of one by doing the Smith machine squats, you're going to be training both quads and glutes. However, one thing I was surprised to see is he said, you're not really training the hamstrings. Hamstrings aren't gonna be trained nearly hard enough. What's interesting to me is how this differs from every individual person. Perhaps it's not the best hamstring exercise, but I know that for me, it's absolutely amazing. When I do squats, which I in fact did yesterday, the only muscle on my body that's in fact sore today is in fact my hamstrings. And so we could argue and say, science says it doesn't really train the hamstrings because it doesn't stretch it a certain way. It doesn't do this or that, but in reality, you will only know. But hamstrings will not be taken care of at all. If you go and do squats and your hamstrings are sore, do you really think you never train them whatsoever? And so perhaps it's not ideal. It's not as good as the seated leg curl, but it's still effective. And for many people, that is in fact enough. If you get sore hamstrings, your legs look good. For example, I rarely ever do a hamstring curl of any kind, laying down, seated, whatever, but yet my hamstrings arguably my best body part. And I've hardly trained them at all for many years. And so why is that? Well, one is genetics and two, I train it indirectly from doing other exercises. And so for example, if you're doing a squat or a leg press, you are in fact still training your hamstrings. My advice, if you're really trying to focus on the quads, hamstrings, and glutes all at the same time to really pause in the hole. On my last set of squats, I paused for one second at the bottom on each and every rep. Did a set of eight. Very heavy for me. But considering I went slower on the eccentric, faster on the concentric, and paused at the bottom, that allowed for an increased tut time under tension and allowed me to build more muscle than last time. What's, what is your max squat now? 507. Nice. Yeah. You beat me. Wait, really? My all time is 501. Real? No way. Congratulations. Damn, okay. <laughs> and so you doubted me before. I said they both had amazing genetics. Think of it. Jeff Nippert at 5'4", perhaps weighing 165 pounds, squatted 501 pounds. That is raw. 100% natural. Will Tennyson, 5'07", also 100% natural. Those are big lifts. Anything over 500 pounds for squat when you're under 200 pounds, that is a very impressive lift. Bro, your quads have gotten bigger too, man. Hit number one that Jeff Nippert doubts Will Tennyson's natty status is, wow. Look at your quads. They've grown tremendously since the last time I've seen you. Remember, they've done a video in the past, perhaps it was two years ago, and since then, Will Tennyson has put on tremendous size. Many of you are going to say, oh, he went on a bulk. Yeah, sure he did. 
but has he gotten fat? I believe in his last DEXA scan, they said he was 9.7% body fat, something to that extent. And so I don't believe he's actually that lean in the real world using my laser eyes, but I do believe he's under 12% body fat. So long length partials is when you do partial reps in the lengthened aspect of the lift. And so they get into detail on long length partials. This is something that you may in fact want to incorporate into your next training session. Long length partials is when you're training the muscle when it's lengthened. Think of it, long length partials. And so for the squat, you're squatting in the hole, the deepest part, the hardest part. And rather than squatting all the way up, you only go halfway up. The temptation for most people is to go a little bit higher. Why is that? Because it's easier as you go up. Think of it. Three Three quarters on the way up, you're actually starting to relax a little. Your glutes, your hamstrings are no longer firing harder than last time. And so my advice, pause. You can pause in the bottom, go halfway up, and again, descent to the floor, pause and repeat. You cannot live heavy weights like this. I repeat, you can't lift heavy when training like this. And so what does this avoid? It avoids ego lifting in the gym. And so what do I think of this training? I think it's amazing. I think it's outstanding. I think you should give it a try. Lighten that weight. Do one or two sets like this, perhaps at the end. If you don't feel like doing your next set to failure and or beyond, you're having a hard day, you don't wanna push yourself that hard, lighten the weight, take off a plate on each side of the squat, pause in the hole and only go halfway up. Very, very difficult. And the research, the science says it may in fact build more muscle than doing the complete repetition. Why do you think that I, Jeff Nippard, prefer the seated hamstring curl over the line? hamstring curl. And so the best exercise for the hamstrings that's suggested by Jeff Nippert is the seated leg curl. Better than the lying leg curl, the reason being that the hamstrings are in a stretched position from the start. Think of it. You're sitting up, your legs are in front of you. You're way more stretched than if you're laying flat down. At the start of a lying leg curl, it's kind of like getting a massage. You relax, it's easy. There's no stretch whatsoever. But you ever gotten into one of those seated leg curl machines? You put your feet up, you get the adjustment, it's very difficult, and you're already feeling the stretch. And so that is the reason why it's a better exercise than in fact laying flat on the bench. Now remember, it's important to like the exercise. And so if you really like lying leg curls more than the seat, then of course do it. Just because the science says that one is better than the other doesn't mean you should do that exercise. What you need is three main factors and one of those is loving the exercises that you're doing. A lot of people think of the incline press as just an upper pec exercise. That is completely blown out of proportion. For the pecs, it's suggested the number one exercise is incline bench press. The reason being is that when you do incline bench press, it still targets the middle, the bottom pecs, essentially everything. But in comparison, when you're doing the flat bench, it doesn't target quite as much the upper pecs. Now remember, if you hate doing incline bench press in comparison to flat or it hurts your shoulders more, then of course, stick with the flat. For me, incline bench press always hurt my shoulders, was uncomfortable, never liked it. And so I never did it. And yet I developed a very good chest after all, had a world record in the bench press. And so if I trained according to the science, perhaps I would never have done a flat bench, would have never broken any records, and perhaps I would have had better development or perhaps I wouldn't have been able to train because of the pain in my shoulders, wouldn't have been able to push harder than last time and wouldn't have had the same muscle growth as I experienced over the years of training the bench press since the age of 10. And so my advice, you can do either, do both. But remember, it's important to enjoy your exercise. And so don't do an exercise if it's painful, stick to what works for you. With these, I actually do like to do higher reps. Three sets for your pecs a week is actually <laughs> enough to make gains for most people. Off but three sets? Yeah, 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 for sure. You probably get about maybe around 60% of your maximum growth potential off of just three sets. And so great news, if you have limited time, you can't train seven days a week. If you just train each muscle group three sets per week, you can get 60% of the same muscle growth as if you train harder than last time, let's call it every single day. What I like to do is to train each muscle group twice a week. I don't do nearly as many sets as many people do, but I believe that gives you 80% the results as training six or even seven days a week. And so you can train like an animal, like a beast, nearly every set to failure, or you can train twice a week. Perhaps you're doing the rest of your time doing cardio. You have other things you need to do. Get 80% of the results as if you train harder than last time every day of the week. All that more important 
and make sure, I think, you take at least one set to failure. Jeff's advice, which I strongly recommend, is he says, always do one set to failure. You might think you went hard enough, you did 15 sets on the bench press, but did you in fact push yourself all out? Because you might have done a set of 15 and realized you could have done 20. Most people, as in perhaps 95% of people in the gym, don't train hard enough to maximize their muscle growth. And so my advice, if you're 95% of people, is to train harder. How hard? Harder than the last time. How many years do I have to explain this? Harder than the last time. Harder than the time before. For back, I think it's one of the rare muscles where you really do want two, exercise, two types of exercises. One is a vertical pull mm -hmm. and one is a horizontal pull. And next up, for the back, you need two exercises. I've been saying this for years. You need one where you're pulling down, one where you're pulling towards the body. And so pulling towards the body, they're doing a chest supported role. I 100% agree with this as it's allowing you to stay stable. You don't need to use your lower back. And so you can concentrate on pushing hard as you can on that very exercise. You want to think about like rounding this out. So like allowing your shoulder blades to pull apart and then squeeze them together as you come up. And so literally stretch at the bottom, Feel it round out slightly and squeeze. Squeeze harder than last time. Don't forget to go slower on the downwards motion, the eccentric, and faster on the way up. And if you can, pause at the top. Do that for every single rep and please do not eagle lift in the gym. I think going to failure on a pull down is more fun. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Let's do that. And so there you have it. Next for your back, you can do either a pull up or a pull down. Jeff says it's more fun to go to failure on a pull down. And so they're choosing what's more fun. And so let that be a lesson for you. There perhaps is one that's better than the other, but reality is what do you really enjoy? Which one are you more likely to push harder on? <laughs> I've gotten so much bigger, bro. It's freaking that's insane. Right. Are you bulking or cutting right now? And so this is where it gets interesting. Jeff Nipper watching Will doing the pull downs. He's literally looking at all that muscle and he's thinking, seriously, dude, you put on all this muscle. Are you bulking? You've gotten much bigger since I've last seen you. Remember, much bigger, not a little bit. And last I checked, Will Tennyson does not have newbie gains. He's been training hard in the gym for 10 years. As you get more experience in the gym, the gains, they start to slow down. But Jeff, he's looking at his physique. He's thinking, well, you're so much bigger. You're so much better. And it's not fat. Are you bulking or cutting right now? And the best part, if you can zoom in on Jeff's face, is the smirk, the smile. If he had said, hey, are you bulking, bro? You look a lot bigger. He wouldn't have been suspicious. But when you smile as you say, hey, are you natty? You still natty? He is doubting Will's natty status 100% right now. Are you bulking or cutting right now? Cutting. You're natural or enhanced right now? <laughs> Some Turk. <laughs> Bulking or cutting right now? Natural or enhanced? Or could it be, is he on Turkesterone? I did not pay them to say this. Is he in fact taking Turk Builder? Could that explain? Of course it could. You don't think that Turk Builder or Ecti Builder can help you to build muscle? Wait till you see the research. I can't wait for how well this video is going to age. Looking back, people are saying, Greg was right all along. Jeff Nippert made a video in the past. Oh, Ecti Builder studies don't work. From a Reddit forum from six years ago. And so imagine in the future if this supplement actually he gets banned by WADA. Looking back, people are going to say, Coach Greg was right all along. I can't wait for that to happen. I can't wait for people to look in the past and say, you know what? Greg wasn't lying. He always tells the truth. He's not lying. Are you bulking or cutting right now? Cutting. You're natural or enhanced right now? <laughs> are we playing truth or drink? Are you bulking or cutting right now? Are you natural and enhanced? Are you on the Turk? Notice no pause between the questions. Trying to catch him off guard. I'll ask him while he's doing the pull downs. Perhaps there's not enough oxygen going to his brain. He's going to slip up. Are you bulking or cutting right now? Cutting. You're natural or enhanced right now? Bulky or cutting? Cutting. Natural heads, then heads. Oh shit! Cookbook. Oh god! Cookbook. Edit that out, Jeff Nippard. We found that reps between two seconds and eight seconds were basically equal. And if you're curious of how long each repetition should take, there's no difference between two seconds and eight, according to the research. Now remember, they're not using IFB Pro enhanced athletes to do these studies. And so we don't know for sure, but for most people, somewhere between two to eight seconds is going to build the most amount of muscle. My advice, mix it up. Perhaps some of your sets, you're going quick. They're only two seconds. Others, perhaps they're four, maybe even eight seconds. You're going very, very slow. But the key take home is 
control the eccentric. I'm telling you, try to go twice as slow on the way down as on the way up. And so if it takes you one second to lift the weight up, try to slowly lower down for two seconds, exhibiting more control than last time. One thing I've been doing lately is actually raising the height of the cable. For the side delt, they're suggesting the cable laterals. Now for me, I don't like it because it's one arm at a time. When I'm in the gym, I don't want to spend as much time. I like training both sides at the same time. Now, if I can do lateral raises with both arms at the same time, no problem. But to use one arm at a time, perhaps doing a set for 30 or 40 seconds and then have to stop and do the other, I don't enjoy it. Now, based on the science, it's a great exercise to do, but for me, it's not a smash, but rather passing on this one. But on this machine, you actually don't get past this position unless you do this and turn side on. Oh. So now you get a pre-stretch on your rear delt and you sweep the weight out like this. For the rear delt, rather than doing reverse pec deck like this, rather than grabbing and pulling like that, you don't get as much of a stretch, so you go sideways, one arm at a time. And so again, it's a great exercise, but you're gonna have to go one arm at a time. I'm not a fan of going to the gym and doing one arm at a time back and forth. It's very difficult mentally to push to failure on one side, then stop and switch to the other. I know that people who are sciencey type of trainers, they do this all the time. For me, I wanna do both arms. I wanna get them over with at the same exact time. But the sign says, uh, maybe not as good. You're not stretching quite as far. I'm gonna argue that because I enjoy doing both arms at the same time more, that that is better for me. I call these Bayesian cable curls, the same as the lateral raises. My bicep will experience peak tension when there's a 90 degree angle between my forearm and the cable. And so for bicep curls, lean forward with a cable with the bar up a bit higher, increases the tension more so at the bottom. Remember the deep stretch of the body, that is where you're gonna build the most muscle, at least based on science. And so if you wanna do these exercises, by all means. But if you simply enjoy those barbell curls or dumbbell curls, remember, this is just what the science is saying. Don't forget, you need to love an exercise. And so if you go to the gym and you're only using cables all the time, one arm at a time, and it's not for you, then Forget about it. You can watch Sam Sulik and just go more balls to the wall than last time. So if we want a stretch, we're gonna achieve that by putting the arm up overhead. For the triceps, best exercise, overhead tricep extensions, stretch all the way to the bottom and squeeze all the way to the top. Remember to slowly lower the weight, keep constant tension on the muscle and to really feel the burn. I do kickbacks this way, I'll show you. I just kind of lean back yeah. so that I can get my arm behind my torso. And the last exercise on the list was tricep kickbacks, of which I'm going to completely discourage. I think it's one of the worst exercises you can do for the triceps. And so I'm not gonna list it as one of the best exercises I do for the triceps when I simply don't enjoy it. And I don't think it's as effective as several other exercises. And so of course, interested in any of the supplements, the clothing line, the cookbooks, training books, all that stuff, visit the website, Code Greg. 15% off. And if you could leave a like, it would help the algorithm. Of course, comment harder than last time. Ending it here. Subscribe, click the bell button, watch one of those two bloops. You can see the cookbook in the back. Don't forget we have a free diet and training program. It's close to 50 pages. People are saying, I can't believe I got all this information for free. It's absolutely amazing. Once you get it, you will know what I'm talking about. Head over to my website. No money, no problem. Get the free diet and training program. Also become one of the 300,000 plus newsletter subscribers. And until next time, I am out.